So moving on out of the GI world, um, cardiorespiratory. Um, this is, uh, I see emergency at Conneaut Lake Veterinary Hospital and a good portion of the cats I see on emergency are respiratory distress cats. And this is kind of what most of this is gonna talk about. Um, so the most common heart disease in cats is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And that means that um, the heart is getting bigger, um, but it's getting thicker at the same time. So um, you may have heard of like dilated cardiomyopathy. The heart gets bigger, but the chambers get uh, large, but the walls get thin. So with this disease, the walls get really thick, really muscular. That's what hypertrophic means. And as a result, the heart chambers get smaller. So with each squeeze of the heart, less blood gets pumped out to the system. And that also creates a lot of turbulence within the chambers of the heart, which promotes clot formation. And so those clots can get shot out to the body as well. Um, there's a, a big genetic component to this, uh, like Maine Coon cats. Uh, a good portion of, the, of them end up with this disease, but we see it in every type of, you know, regular just domestic short hair cat, whatever it may be. Um, so there's other factors involved as well. Clinical signs are usually, by the time we see it, respiratory distress, unless like a murmur or something has been picked up on a physical exam previously, most owners don't really notice anything. And cats with this don't always have a murmur. So just because there's not a murmur doesn't always mean it's not there. So these cats, you know, typically come in difficulty breathing, uh, maybe open mouth breathing, sometimes blue gums, blue tongue, that type of thing. Um, like I said, sometimes we'll notice a murmur or arrhythmia. You may notice like weight loss at home, just like in people who have ongoing heart disease. It pulls a lot of extra resources from the body. Um, and then like I said, we might not notice anything until they kind of break with a, a cardiac failure situation. Um, so diagnosis for this um, is an echocardiogram to look at the heart, uh, evaluate the thickness of those chambers and the walls. Um, X-rays to look at, again, the size of the heart, but also is there any fluid in the lungs from failure or fluid around the lungs from heart failure that's going on. Uh, blood work uh, to make sure there's nothing else going on at the same time. A lot of times we see um, kidney disease in these guys just from changes that go on in the heart, affects the kidneys and vice versa. Um, and then we can see uh, changes in the body elsewhere from the heart not working, not getting poor perfusion to the liver and kidneys, that type of thing. And then uh, an electrocardiogram or ECG uh, to help us evaluate the contractility of the heart um, and some of the electricity moving through it. Um, treatment, um, it's a, kind of a grab bag of various heart medications depending on, on what's going on. Those are usually geared towards slowing down failure, so getting some fluid out of the system and slowing down the changes that are happening within the heart, some of the structural changes that are happening with this disease. Um, diet change is very important, so getting uh, like low sodium foods, um, so there's less strain on the heart from the extra salt being there, again, similar to people. And then supportive care, you know, so um, fluids if they need it, uh, cautiously of course, um, pain medications, that type of thing. Another common presentation for these cats, which I didn't mention, is um, paralysis of the back legs. We call this a saddle thrombus. So remember how I said uh, with that heart not working well, we get clot formation. So a lot of times those clots uh, will go out of the heart through the aorta and get lodged like right here, where the, the blood vessels for the legs split off and so the, the back legs don't get any blood flow. Uh, and so they become acutely paralyzed in the back legs and it's very painful. Um, so they're typically, you know, crying, um, you know, trying to get around on their front legs. That's a, an, another common presentation with this. Um, so some x-rays here for you. On an x-ray, air is black like here outside the cat. Dense things like the bones here and the spine are white and everything else is a shade of gray in between. So on the left here, we have a normal cat chest. Um, so this is the heart here within this black triangle, which is the lungs because they're filled with air, so they're black. So this is a normal sized heart. If you count rib spaces, that's roughly, you know, like two and a half, three. If we look at this x-ray over here, this is a cat with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Can you see how big the heart is here compared to that one? Um, and then can you appreciate how it's not quite as black here and here as it is on that 
film, that's because there's fluid in the, in the lungs uh, from heart failure. So that's what we're looking for on x-rays. Uh, pleural effusion, this is another thing that really isn't a primary disease itself, but is secondary to something else, um, but is a very common cause for cardiorespiratory problems in cats. See it very frequently on emergency. And this is where there's fluid in between the chest wall and the lungs. So there's a little space there, and normally there's just a very scant amount of fluid for some lubrication. But pleural effusion is when there is way too much fluid in there. This fluid can be just kind of water. It can be like a milky fluid from the lymph ducts. It can be blood. Um, there's a variety of causes, heart failure, um, masses, uh, like feline leukemia, FIV. But all of them are bad, essentially. There's nothing that's a, an easy, quick fix that causes pleural effusion. Um, clinical signs are usually respiratory distress because those lungs are squished, so they can't you know, fill up with a lot of air with each breath, so they tend to be breathing really rapidly. Maybe open mouth breathing, have blue gums. Um, we diagnose it via x-rays and or ultrasound. Um, the treatment is immediate removal of that fluid because that's going to make them breathe easier. Regardless of the cause, you know, sometimes we don't know that right away, but we know there's fluid there. If we can get the fluid off of the chest, they can at least breathe easier and be stable while we try and figure out some other things. And then, of course, treating the under underlying cause. If it's you know, heart disease that has a little bit, bit better prognosis than if there was like a mass in the chest or a bleeding disorder or something like that. But um, so here's another x-ray. Uh, so remember the previous image, all the black air-filled lung that we saw before? On this cat with pleural effusion, these are the lungs right here that were taking up all of this space. So all this gray stuff that's filling where the black was in the previous image, that's fluid, and the lungs are squished down. Uh, into just that little bit of space. So you can see the amount of space they should be taking up with each breath, but that's the only space they have because there's so much fluid there. Um, this right here, this big black spot, that is the stomach. So this cat's been in respiratory distress trying to breathe, so it's swallowing a lot of air and it's all going into the stomach. The last um, cardiorespiratory thing we'll talk about is uh, upper respiratory tract infection. We kind of touched on this already. The bulk cause of this is all of those things that we vaccinate for in that FVRCP vaccine, so herpes virus, Khaleesi virus. Um, sometimes we can see it secondary to nasopharyngeal polyps, which are like a little inflammatory growth that cats can get kind of in the, the back of their mouth or inner ear, and it can kind of hang down in the back of their throat and be like a constant irritant. Usually you'll hear some like weird noises when they're breathing, like they're snoring almost with that. Clinical signs of the typical upper respiratory tract infection are sneezing, coughing, discharge from the nose and eyes, and um, oftentimes inappetence or anorexia. Cats are notorious um, for if they can't smell, they won't eat. Um, you, we can have a cat come in who hasn't been eating for a week because it's had nasal discharge. We clean off the nose and they go to town on some food that we put in front of them. So if, if there's discharge on the nose, if there's something blocking the nose, I promise you the cat will probably not eat. They, they're very uh, smell uh, driven when it comes to eating. Um, so diagnosis uh, for this is basically just the clinical signs in the history. If it's a stray kitten that came in and has discharge from the eyes and the nose and it's sneezing, it's an upper respiratory tract infection. Um, in an older cat, you know, we can see some of those signs with, uh, you know, like masses in the head or nasal passage, some other things like that. Um, but if the history supports it, you know, that's, it's pretty straightforward typically. Um, because the cause is usually one of those viral diseases that just hang out in the system long term, we usually, are, our treatment is usually geared toward the secondary infections that happen. So let's say it's a herpes virus in, in a cat and it flares up. Um, the herpes virus causes some problems in itself, but the main problems, all the discharge and stuff that we see, is usually from secondary bacterial infections. So we usually put these guys on an antibiotic to kind of clear that up while their body can do its job and kind of quiet down the virus. In a lot of these cats that have long-term reoccurring infections, we can try some antivirals. 
There are some that we can use that aren't too expensive, and some studies show that they're pretty effective. Um, but a lot of the ones uh, that are strongly effective are, are just very cost prohibitive and don't always work, so it's, it's not usually a good What's option. What's that one on these? Is it li lysine or something? Lysine? Yeah. That's a, a, an amino acid, and it's a supplement. And um, it's kind of controversial. About half the studies say it works, half the studies say it don't. Um, but those that do have found that this amino acid slows down the replication of the herpes virus. So it's not getting rid of the herpes virus, it's not destroying the herpes virus, but it's uh, basically decreasing how much herpes virus there is in the system. And that's, uh, that comes in like little treat forms. You can buy it at GNC at Walmart in a powdered form and sprinkle it on the food. I think it's like 500 milligrams per cat per day. Um, it's safe to use, doesn't really have any side effects. It's something that's in their diet anyway. We're just giving a little bit extra. And then supportive care for these guys. So keeping the nose clean, um, nasal saline drops if we need to, um, a high quality food to get some energy into them, that type of thing. So this is a little kitten with upper respiratory tract infection. You can see the discharge from the eyes here, the discharge from the nose. He's been coughing, sneezing. It's like a, a mucousy pus type of discharge, very classic for that. Um, if we look at his eyes, his third eyelids are up, and that could be related to um, some ulcers in the eye, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but like the herpes virus can cause some ulcers too in the eye, not just all respiratory stuff. So that all kind of goes hand in hand. Uh, urogenital, um, this is probably the biggest one, chronic kidney disease. Um, basically, if a cat lives to be old enough, it's probably going to get this. Um, it's degeneration and loss of kidney function. Uh, as the kidneys degenerate, they fill up with scar tissue. Scar tissue is good for filling in space, but it doesn't really do anything. So it's not a functional kidney tissue. Um, and so the causes are multifactorial. There's genetic component to it. Um, there's question as to um, the diets we feed, if that fills into it, you know, using like dry food all the time versus wet food that has more moisture, um, all sorts of ideas as to what causes it, but very, very common. Clinical signs, increased drinking and urination. Um, so what's happening is um, blood is being filtered by the kidney, and like I said before, normally it pulls out the water, right, because we want to conserve water so we can do what we need to do. Um, in the, the cat with chronic kidney disease, because there's not as much functional kidney mass, it's not pulling out that water. So all that water is just cut, running straight through unfiltered. Um, it gets urinated out and the cat starts to get a little dehydrated. The brain says drink more water and we just kind of keep going in that pattern. Keep losing more water so the cat keeps drinking more water and it keeps going like that. Um, that's kind of the initial sign that we'll see. Um, we can see weight loss excuse me, kind of long term if it keeps going because we know we're losing protein and stuff through the urine as well with this disease. Um, weakness, uh, we're losing electrolytes uh, so they can get low potassium which can cause difficulty moving around. Um, they can become anemic. The kidneys are kind of the first step in red blood cell production. They send the signal to the bone marrow that says make more red blood cells. So if the kidneys aren't working and that signal doesn't get sent so they can become anemic. And they can um, also present with GI signs as well, just to make things even more complicated. So vomiting, diarrhea, because as uh, the toxins that the kidneys normally filter out build up, they're toxic to the GI tract. And so we can see problems with that as well. And that's often what causes uh, anorexia in these guys too. Um, diagnosis is usually blood work, looking to see how high those kidney values are. And then we always, always, always have to do a urinalysis with that because there's a lot of other things that can cause those kidney values to go up that aren't related to the kidneys, such as just being dehydrated. Um, if, the, if the heart isn't pumping out a lot of blood, it's going to cause those kidney values to go up. So to truly diagnose this, we have to show that the kidneys aren't concentrating urine, meaning that water is just coming through untouched, and the kidney values are high. We have to have those two pieces of information. Um, to diagnose. From there, we can stage it. Um, in veterinary medicine, we use the same staging system that they use in people, the iris system. 
and uh, it's a stage of one to four, and it just basically tells us how severe the, the renal disease is and how many kind of consequences are there, like how much protein is being lost in the urine, and are there any blood pressure changes with that. So we'll often recommend if people want to do staging an abdominal ultrasound, make sure there's no masses or cysts or anything on the kidneys. Make sure the kidneys look consistent with these chronic changes, um, a blood pressure reading, and sending a urine sample to the lab to measure how much protein is in it and being lost that way. The treatment really depends on the stage. Um, so there's usually, regardless of the stage, uh, there's a diet change to make the workload of the kidneys a little bit less. Um, phosphate binders, potassium supplementation, fluid therapy, um, antiemetics, things to reduce uh, stomach acid. There, there's a lot of things that we can do to manage these guys. Typically, um, this disease is not rapidly progressive, it's slowly progressive, so oftentimes they'll come in, they'll have kind of a flare-up, not feel well, we'll put them on fluids, get them feeling better, they'll be fine for a few months, maybe have another little flare-up, um, but it's usually manageable long-term. You said ultrasound, blood pressure, and urinalysis? Uh, and blood work, blood work. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what uh, normal, normally is the uh, blood pressure of a cat? It's very similar to people like 120 over 80. And the temperature? Anywhere from like 99.5 to 102.5. You're welcome. So this is just a little diagram showing the changes in the kidney. Number one is a normal kidney. It's nice and plump. Uh, and you can kind of see the size. Going to number two, it's starting to shrivel up a little bit and it's a little bit smaller. And then number three, this is where we really start to see the efficacy of the kidney change. It's all shriveled up and bumpy and it's very small. That kidney is not doing much work. Uh, another common thing, lower, lower urinary tract disease in cats, two big causes, stones, so like bladder stones, um, or what we call feline idiopathic cystitis. Um, the stones are kind of more straightforward. There's extra calcium, extra phosphate, infection or something in the urinary tract that causes precipitation and formation of those stones. Um, those stones themselves can get lodged in the urethra, especially in a male cat, and cause them to be blocked. You may have heard of that before, and that's a, a medical emergency if they can't urinate. Um, the feline idiopathic cystitis, again, kind of going back to some of these trends that we're seeing today, is one of these unknown inflammatory conditions. It's usually in very high stress cats, and there's some interplay between kind of the stress hormones and the immune system that causes inflammation in the bladder and excess production of kind of mucus, and they can get mucus plugs that can also get stuck in the urethra and cause them to get blocked, both of which are an emergency. So clinical signs of this is difficulty urinating, bloody urine, um, small but frequent urinations, vocalizing, looking at the genital area. People usually come in and say, you know, he's been spending all day in the litter box just crying. That's kind of the typical presentation. Um, their belly can be tense because their bladder is getting fuller and fuller because they can't urinate. Diagnosis is um, blood work, urinalysis, and usually some combination of imaging, whether it's x-ray or ultrasound, uh, to see what's going on there. The treatment, if it's stones, is surgery to remove the stones and then typically like a diet change to prevent them from coming back. And if it's the idiopathic uh, inflammatory uh, inflammation of the bladder, pain medication, diet change, and stress reduction, whether it's in the environment um, or with some of the like pheromone diffusers and things like that to, to get them calmed down. The typical presentation for those idiopathic cystitis cats is like, uh, we put up the Christmas tree last week or we had some family over a couple days ago. It's just like little tiny things that the cat doesn't really show us that they're stressed, but those little changes cause the, the changes within the body. So this is a, an x-ray of a cat um, that has bladder stones. So all the same principles apply um, with air being black, bone being white, and everything else being a shade of gray. So we're focusing on the abdomen here, which is kind of more this triangle. We were in the chest up there before. So this little slightly gray uh, balloon here is the bladder. And then do you see the white speckles in the middle? Yeah, uh, those are the stones. Um, and they're, they show up white because they're really dense like bone. 
Um, skin, uh, one of the more common things we see is flea allergy dermatitis. This is an allergic reaction to flea saliva. And cats with this allergy only need one bite from a flea to kind of really set them off systemically. So clinical signs, itching, scabs, little pustules throughout the hair coat. We can see hair loss often over the base of the tail or the lumbar spine area. And then obviously fleas or flea dirt. Flea dirt is little black specks that you can see in their hair coat. And it's actually um, digested blood or flea excrement essentially. If, you, uh, if you're ever unsure, you can take a comb, brush them, get some of the specks, put it on a paper towel, wet it down and squish it. And if it's flea dirt, it'll turn red because it's digested blood. If it's just regular dirt from being outside, then it will stay black brown. Um, the treatment is uh, pretty straightforward. Antibiotics to clear up the skin infection that's there. Steroids to shut down that allergic response that's happening. Year round flea prevention, which we recommend anyway. Um, and then prevention for other uh, animals in the house as well. Because you could have flea prevention on the, the cat with the allergy, but if another cat isn't on prevention and has fleas, just that one flea could still jump on, get a quick bite in, and then die, uh, but still cause the, the allergic flare up and treatment of the house if that's needed. <laughs> um, flea prevention mm -hmm. um, advantage. Mm -hmm. She gets sick on it. I mean, she'll, she'll sit there like she's gonna die. And then, <laughs> and then uh, she'll, if, you know, I try to keep her from licking it, but she'll, she'll go like this, and then she'll lick her paw. Yeah. And, you know, I can't watch her every second, but mm -hmm. that's what she does. She just sits there like, I'm gonna die. <laughs> um, so there's uh, advantage is good, not for her. Um, Frontline is another good one. Uh, Revolution is a, a different type. And then there is um, a new generation of flea collar out there. Typically you say flea collar and people are like, oh, no, not a flea collar. Um, but it's made by um, like Betro who makes Advantage. And it's, it's a flea collar that can stay on. It has like a, a 10 pound or something a break point. So if they were to get stuck on something, it would easily snap off. Um, it prevents against ticks as well. So it's a good option for outdoor cats. The benefit is it doesn't have that liquid spot, you know, on the back. So they can't like really get it and groom it off. It just kind of stays on there. I think it has a little like reflectivity on there for outdoor cats too, if they're trying to cross the road or something. But that's another option too. Um, they're starting to come out with some oral flea preventatives too. Um, that often have some heartworm protection them as, in them as well. So if she doesn't, you know, like the flea collar either, that might be something that would be good for her too. Okay. How long does the flea collar last? Um, six to eight months. Um, and that's typically more an issue for dogs who do a lot of swimming. So probably more like eight months than a cat, unless your cat's like jumping in the lake and fishing or something. So this is a cat with flea allergy dermatitis. You can see the hair loss at the base of the tail, kind of all the redness and crusts and pustules and stuff that's going on with the skin there. Um, talk about eyes. A uh, very common thing is corneal ulcers. The cornea is the clear part of the eye that's kind of right out in front. Um, it's basically a thin layer of modified skin. You can kind of think of it that way. And an ulcer is a defect in that. So that layer has been compromised uh, in one way or another. It can happen for a lot of reasons, like infectious causes, like the herpes virus that we talked about, trauma. So a cat's running through the brush, gets a seed in the eye, um, scratch from another cat, that type of thing. Very, very, very painful. Um, remember, cats are stoic. They don't always show their pain well, but this is uh, like the gingivitis, you know, a very painful condition. Um, I had one myself once, and I can attest that it is not fun. Um, so clinical signs are tearing, squinting, discharge from the eye, uh, redness around the eye, redness of the white part of the eye, like lots of blood vessels coming in. You might notice um, if it goes on for a while that the front of the eye will become hazy looking or blue looking. Um, and sometimes if it's a large defect, you can even see like that crater or something in the cornea. Uh, diagnosis for this um, is a staining test called a fluorescein stain. And that's a, a little stain that we put in the eye. And we use a, a special light uh, to shine it on there. 
And that stain only um, sticks to the deeper layers of the cornea, not the surface. So if there's any defect, it'll stick to it. We shine our light in there and it glows this pretty yellowish green color. Um, sometimes we'll recommend some other tests at the same time, like a tear test uh, to make sure there's no tear deficiency and that's what's causing the ulcer. Ocular pressures for like uh, checking for glaucoma. Um, and then of course, just a good ophthalmic exam in general to make sure there's no uh, foreign bodies in there, uh, stray hairs that could be scratching the cornea, eyelid abnormalities, that type of thing. Um, the basis of treatment is antibiotics, uh, like drops in the eye, sometimes systemic oral ones as well, depending on how severe it is. Uh, pain medication, because it is painful, an e-collar so that they can't bump their eye on anything else or paw at it. Um, that's a very common cause for, for reoccurrence is it starts to heal up and then they clean their face and it happens all over again. And then treatment of the underlying cause. So if it is uh, tear film deficiency, you know, treating that um, and so on and so forth. So that's a cat with a corneal ulcer. You can see that uh, the left eye is normal and then that is obviously the side that's affected. Um, you can see the redness around the eyes. We have discharge coming down here. Um, you can see this one has gone on for a little bit, so the clear cornea over there is now like really white and hazy. And it's hard to see, but there's like little blood vessels coming into little red lines that are going to where that ulcer is because they're trying to heal it. <clears throat> um, musculoskeletal issues, I'm just going to touch on arthritis. Uh, because this is a very common thing that's overlooked a lot. Um, a recent study um, came out that found um, cats over 10 years of age, uh, over 90% of them had some degree of arthritis. And that makes sense. Older people have arthritis, older dogs have arthritis. Why is it overlooked in cats? I think it's because they hide their pain uh, better than other species. Um, so the clinical signs are very subtle. So it tends to be a change in the cat's routine. They're not jumping up on their favorite windowsill. They're not getting on the back of the couch. They seem to hang around downstairs more often versus than walking up the stairs. Um, they're not you know, jumping or playing with a certain toy that they used to have. Really subtle things like that. Um, and uh, again, it's inflammation, so it's painful. So I think uh, a lot of people say, you know, oh, like, yeah, he's not doing as much, but I don't think he's in pain. Well, if, if, he, was in, if he wasn't in pain, he would still be doing all of his normal things, um, is how I tend to think about it. And so uh, diagnostics for this, physical exam, you know, just manipulation, seeing how the joints move, can we feel any grinding or anything like that, and then x-rays to, to look for actual arthritis that's needed to confirm. Treatment is pain medication uh, and anti-inflammatories to help with that. Joint supplementation, uh, like glucosamine chondroitin, like people take, just to kind of help promote healthy joints and keep things happy that way. Uh, laser therapy, weight loss, and physical therapy. And nothing too intense, it's stuff you can do at home, like massaging, um, some passive range of motion where you extend the legs and then flex the legs. It's nothing you know, really in depth. It's something that can easily be done at home. It feels good for the cat, they like the extra attention, and it makes them feel better too. Decreased uh, jumping. Mm -hmm. um, she's only four, but um, I believe that she has trouble with uh, if I get her going with that with a board and uh -huh. the feathers on it, she will jump really high once or twice and then she goes down. And I've discovered that when I'm trimming her nails, I flip her over on her back mm -hmm. and she usually just goes through, you know, and, down. and she'll let me cut them and file them. But if I go this way with a file, instead of this way, uh -huh. she'll cry. And I no noticed her, her nails are all split. Mm -hmm. Like they're f flaking mm -hmm. apart. And um, the carpet is like Berber. So when she, I think when she comes down on it, they might, you know, yeah, yeah. turn or something. And then mm -hmm. she doesn't want to jump anymore. But is that normal for cats to have nails like that? Well, the, um, 
There's a couple of things. The nail kind of grows out like this, like all the fibers come like this. So when you're filing this way, you're kind of going with that natural grain. When you come side to side, that's coming against it. And so that can kind of promote like some of the brittleness. So if you can go like up and down, just like with the grain, and that might help with that. Um, the brittleness, you know, sometimes like a vitamin E supplement, like a fish oil on the food can help with like skin and nail strength, that type of thing. Um, and what was the other part of your question? That was that they okay. brittleness. Yeah. And then, you know, we do see arthritis in younger animals too. It's often like really active, like hunting dogs or something where they start to get some arthritis in, the, in their wrists and things already. And so it certainly is possible for younger animals to have arthritis, you know, after some high impact events that might flare up a little bit. And so she might not, you know, go as much, but, um, Typically, you know, we, like I said, we do x-rays to kind of figure out if there is anything there. So this is uh, an x-ray here. This is a normal cat elbow on the left. So we have um, the humerus here, this bone, and then the two forearm bones here. And see this like nice black line that comes around like a nice circle? That's kind of the joint space there. And everything's really smooth and solid looking. And then we look at this joint over here. This is a cat with arthritis in the elbow. See all this extra bone production coming off? Um, this, like we lose that nice black circle. Even uh, like this is getting like really dense looking because it's basically like scarring of the bone. And so um, that's what we're looking for on x-rays when we do that to check for arthritis. Okay, enough with common diseases. Um, just a quick thing on over-the-counter uh, medications. In general, I would say it's best not to give anything without consultation uh, with a veterinarian. And I don't say that to be like a stickler or say that you can't do things at home, but if, if we don't know what's going on, we can make things a lot worse by giving the wrong medication. Um, so there's always people who I think are willing to give you advice. I'm on call Monday through Friday morning every evening. There's my phone number. You'll get the hospital and they'll page me. I'm happy to talk to you about anything that might be going on after hours. Um, and sometimes we can come up with some things that you can give at home. But um, many drugs uh, are dangerous if the correct dose isn't given. So like aspirin, people, sometimes people will give aspirin uh, thinking that you know, their cat might be painful or something. If there's kidney disease present, um, that aspirin can be very, very dangerous because it changes the blood flow to the already suffering kidneys. Um, if there's a clotting problem going on, you know, same thing. Um, so aspirin can be used in some cases in cats, but if we're not sure what's going on, it can also cause, you know, problems. Some medications that humans take are toxic, you know, like Tylenol. Cats have a, a very horrible, um, life-threatening reaction to Tylenol. Um, they get severe facial swelling and paw swelling uh, and severe liver trouble. Um, and so uh, I'm on call. There's the emergency hospital in Erie that's available after hours as well. They're always happy to talk to you. Um, uh, I wouldn't do it unless we know like how the kidneys are functioning. Yeah. Typically we do that um, for those heart disease cats that ha are prone to clotting. Sometimes we'll do low dose aspirin. Um, but before I give any non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, whether it's one of the human ones or the veterinary ones that we know are safe for dogs and cats, it's always nice to know that the kidneys are working like they should because we know that those medications do affect the kidneys. They affect the liver as well, but uh, it's more of a kind of a reaction type of thing versus a long-term change. Litter boxes. Um, so one of the big questions I get is how many litter boxes should I have? And the general rule of thumb is you should have two for the first cat and then one for every cat after that. So if you have uh, three cats in your house, you would want to have two litter boxes for the first cat and then one, two for the other two cats. So a total of four. <clears throat> so if you have six cats, you need how many litter boxes? You would need seven litter boxes. I'm way over that. <laughs> And if you're ever unsure, more is better than too few. Um, be, I mean, it's kind of crass, but just think about people. You know, like when you go to the fair, like nobody wants to use that porta potty. Like it's just kind of nasty. Everybody's using it. It's it's overused. But like in your home, you have your nice clean bathroom, and it's it's all good to go. What, Cats if, you are, have, what if you have less but clean and more? Uh, it it kind of depends on the cats. 
Uh, sometimes they'll still be totally fine with it. Uh, sometimes we run into problems where uh, one cat prefers, you know, like this litter box and the other one won't go in it. Sometimes they like to have their own like bathroom space essentially. So if you have less and they're doing fine, it might not be an issue. But if we start to run into problems, like one cat just continually has a bowel movement outside the litter box, oftentimes adding that extra litter box in will kind of do the trick. Um, so size matters sometimes um, with large cats, whether just like big breeds like a Maine Coon or overweight cats, sometimes they don't fit well in their litter box and so they can't always uh, hit the litter. Uh, and so sometimes we see that as a problem and so getting a, a bigger litter box often can help uh, with situations like that. And geriatric cats or cats with arthritis often have a difficult time getting into the litter box. So a common report that I get is like, you know, he goes over to the litter box, but then he just goes to the bathroom right next to it. Well, it could be because he's sore and he can't, you know, hop into it like he used to. So sometimes getting a more shallow litter box can help with, with things like that. And then, like you said, keeping it clean, you know, is, is one of the biggest things. You could have 20 litter boxes for two cats, but if they're all dirty, they're still not going to use them. So, you know, ideally daily cleaning of the litter box to get things out of there and just keep it uh, a nice environment. Should you have just sift it to get it out, or how often should you change the whole thing? Uh, it kind of depends on how much use it gets, um, but you know, daily cleaning to get to sift it and get the organic material out of there, and then you know, like once a week or so, if needed, to actually change the litter if it, if it's starting to get dirty. Um, another big point on keeping it clean is um, if it's a multi-cat household, cats can pass diseases to one another. Uh, like GI parasites. So if one cat has roundworms, maybe it's a new cat to the house, and the other cat's been dewormed and is on heartworm prevention, so we know it's not going to get reinfected with roundworm, but the new cat comes in and they share the same litter box, the, the old cat could pick up that parasite from the new cat. So um, that's another reason it's important to keep it clean and, and keep up with fecal checks and everything like that. Can you tell by looking at the litter box if there's worms? Sometimes. Um, so the way that the, the parasites work is that they're, they're somewhere in the GI tract and then they, they shed at one point or another. And so uh, for like a round worm, you know, it's typically like two or three weeks before we start to see any shedding. So, you know, you could have found the cat on week one after its infection and it might not show any worms in the stool for like two weeks. Um, so those are like really spaghetti looking like worms. The most common one that people report is tapeworms and they look like little segments uh, of rice kind of stuck around the rectum. And so you might see that when a cat's walking through the house or, or on the bowel movement. So a little grain of rice looking type of thing. Um, grooming, what's that? If you got a uh, cat that doesn't cover his stool, mm -hmm. is it just a lazy cat? Or? It, it's probably just the cat. I don't think there's really like any medical or concerning reason behind it. Yeah, he probably just doesn't want to take the time to do it. <laughs> oh, there you go. Spoiled. I knew it. I knew it. Um, so a uh, big question I get is why is my cat not grooming? Um, you can see this cat is really unkempt looking. The fur is kind of bunched up and uh, not really like big mats, but kind of little tiny mats going on there. Um, uh, very common cause is obesity. If the cat is, is too large, it can't reach certain parts of its body and, and so it can't clean them. So uh, keeping your cat at a good body weight is one way to promote good grooming habits. Um, if they're painful, again like if they have arthritis or something, it might be uh, difficult for them to turn around and clean like they used to or bring their arm up to their, their mouth to lick and clean their face, that type of thing. And then with any illness in general, uh, a cat can stop grooming if they're not feeling well. So. Um, if, if they're not overweight, there's good chance that there's another medical reason for it. And so it's often a, a good idea to get them checked out and make sure nothing's going on internally that we can't see from the outside. As far as what you can do at home, if it's a, a normal healthy cat, you might not need to do anything, especially if it has a, if it has a short hair coat. Um, they can pretty much take care of themselves. Um, often for the long-haired breeds, uh, regular brushing is kind of a must just because that can eventually get tangled and matted over time. Even though they're doing their best to groom, it's just kind of the nature of having longer hair. Um, you can brush short-haired cats too. Uh, a lot of them enjoy it, some of them don't. 
Um, and then occasional bathing, um, not done as commonly in cats as it is in dogs, but just use like a, a pet approved shampoo. Some of the human shampoos can dry out a little bit and cause some irritation. And I probably wouldn't do it more than once a month just to, so we don't dry out the coat too much. I use uh, Huggies baby wipes. Mm -hmm. They're super soft and yeah. big. And doesn't have a problem yeah, yeah, that's good. Like uh, baby shampoo kind of has the less irritation like the pet shampoo, so that's good. Um, if there's a medical reason, like a, like a skin disease or something, sometimes the vet will have you bathe more frequently than that with like a special shampoo, but under normal conditions, once a month is probably enough if you need to do it at all. Um, Decline, so we can... It's a very controversial issue. Um, want to make sure everybody knows what it is first of all. It's not just removal of the claw, the nail that you see. Um, I think a lot of people think that's what it is. It's actual. It's a partial amputation of the toe. So if we look at my finger, I've got one, two, three bones in there, right? Everybody see that in their finger? Decline is removing this first, the last bone and the nail associated with it. So if I, if I got declawed, it'd be taking this off right here and up, and all this would stay behind. So that's what declawing is. Um, this is just my opinion. Uh, it's a very hot topic. Uh, when is it appropriate? Like I said, the vet's first thing in the oath is to protect uh, the public. So I think if there's a health risk for the human, it's appropriate. If, it's a, if there's young children in the home that could be scratched, there's elderly people in the home that have fragile skin that could be injured or immunocompromised people because we know the cat nails carry some, some special bacteria. I think those are all uh, appropriate reasons to do it. Um, if there's aggressive behavior, the cat acts out towards you know, other cats or you know, people working on behavioral modification stuff, obviously, but we can't have people you know, getting abscesses or scratches and stuff in the meantime. And then um, if, if it comes down to loss of a home, you know, a lot of times people get a cat and it's scratching everything up, it's scratching family members, and it's either it gets declawed or it goes to the shelter. Um, you know, it's not that these people don't love the cat, that, you know, they're trying everything that they can, but if it comes to, you know, the cat having the declaw procedure or, you know, being put outside or going to the shelter, then I think it's appropriate to, to do the procedure so it can stay in, in the otherwise good home. <clears throat> so, if the cat's part of the outdoor cat, should you leave the claws? As if the cat the is outdoor, I would leave the claws. Yeah, okay. And what about front claws versus... I'm getting there. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm getting, getting there. there. <laughs> I was hurrying here. I was um, so worried about that. Yeah, so if the cat's outdoors, they're going to be exposed to predators that an indoor-only cat wouldn't be, so it's almost kind of unfair to take the claws at that point. Um, then you get into the whole like wildlife debate, but we won't touch that for now. Um, so new advances in declaw, I think this is important because if we do make, it's a big decision to make, you know, for the cat. Um, so if we do do it, there's some new advances that I think make the procedure a lot better nowadays than it used to be. It typically used to be done with a scalpel, like most traditional surgery was, um, and it was very, very painful. So we've changed the way that we do things, so when we do do a declaw, it's a better experience for the cat overall. Uh, so the first thing is, um, at our hospital, we use CO2 laser surgery versus scalpel. And so that uses like an actual laser beam to do the cutting versus a stainless steel scalpel blade. The advantages there is that the laser um, cauterizes as it cuts, so there's no bleeding. Um, one of the big problems traditionally was that the, the paws would just bleed and bleed and we'd have to have bandages on for a long time and so on and so forth. So there's almost no bleeding when we do it with the laser. Um, because it is stopping that bleeding, there's significantly less inflammation. And inflammation causes pain, right, like we talked about. So if we decrease inflammation, we decrease the pain associated with it. Um, so those are kind of the, the big advantages with that. It's also um, faster, more precise. Um, we're not, you know, like gouging the bone as we go through. Um, there are other methods out there of doing it uh, traditionally other than the scalpel, which are very sketchy and even worse off than the scalpel blade. Um, pain medication. Um, traditionally, you know, 
decades ago, people said that animals didn't even feel pain, you know? So these cats would get part of their finger removed and not have any pain medication. So of course they were unhappy afterwards. Now we use multimodal pain medication, so different classes of uh, pain management drugs to kind of get all causes of pain before they can get to the brain and say that that hurts. Um, between the new pain medication and the laser surgery, I, I never witnessed this because I'm a recent grad, um, but uh, Dr. Wade, who I worked with, um, she said, you know, it used to be, you know, the cats would have bandages for a few days and just be kind of laying in their cage. And now, like, they wake up from anesthesia and they're playing in their cage with toys and crawling on the bars. And so, it, obviously, not in any significant discomfort from it because of these extra steps that we've taken. Another thing that we recommend at our hospital is laser therapy or photomodulation. And that uses um, basically light energy. Uh, to stimulate the cells and decrease inflammation and increase blood flow to promote healing. So that's a, another kind of pain medication, anti-inflammatory component that we can offer. Um, so alternatives. Uh, so the nail caps, like you mentioned, um, they use a special like epoxy adhesive and it uses um, like a special plastic or like silicon type of material and it basically puts a cap on each nail. I think they typically stay on for like a few weeks. Uh, it might even be up to like some months for some of the products now. We have a few clients that use them, but they put them on their self. Um, so I'm not quite as familiar with them, but that's an option for um, like an indoor cat that we don't want to get declawed, but is like scratching its stuff. It's really pricey, isn't it? It, it is expensive, I believe, yeah. Um, and then kind of the biggest thing, you know, before we go to, you know, the nail caps or the surgery, I always try and get people to do behavioral modification first. If it's something as simple as putting a scratching post in the corner of the living room or doing some positive reinforcement with some treats and things like that to when they're scratching to distract them and turn them onto a toy or a command or something, if that's all it takes to stop scratching behavior, then that's the best case scenario. If we have to go forward with something else, then you know, we kind of jump that hurdle when we get to it. But this is the most benign and least invasive thing that we can do. My cat's real good at scratching my chairs and mm -hmm. so on. And someone told me to put uh, lemon foil, so that's what I did. And, I and they stopped scratching, yeah. Yeah, they don't like that feeling and, and sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one cat that doesn't retract his claws. Is mm -hmm. that normal, or is it just some cats will leave them out more than others? Um, as long as there's no like discharge or inflammation or pain or anything there, it's probably nothing to worry about. You can uh, kind of manipulate them too and see if they will go back in, because some cats will just kind of have them out more often than others. So like when you're trimming their nails, you know how you kind of like pop it out, the nail. You can kind of see if it will like go back. How often are you supposed to trim them? Are you supposed to trim them? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. And so it kind of depends on the cat and their activity level. So a really active cat, you won't have to do as much. A cat that uses a scratching post all the time, you won't have to do as much. So um, at least once a month, sometimes every two weeks. If it's a really like old, inactive cat, maybe even once a week, just taking the tips off. Uh, and it's just like with dogs, the longer the nails get, the longer the quick or that bed of blood vessels and nerves get. Uh, and so if you at least take the tips off regularly, um, that will keep the nails shorter and keep that blood vessel kind of retracted back in there. Um, so some stress-free handling tips. Um, kind of just gonna talk about crate training um, because that's where I see the most problems. Um, people come in, the cat's hissing in the carrier, their arms are all scratched up. I can already tell it has not been a good day so far. <laughs> Um, so making the carrier a happy place for the cat um, will make life a lot easier for you and for the cat. So um, this is just kind of a step-by-step -step crate training process that you can do um, at home. Uh, so start feeding your cat uh, in the carrier. So uh, a lot of people are familiar with crate training with dogs. You know, you feed your dog in the crate. It's the same thing with the cat. Um, 
have them eat in there. They don't have to go all the way in to eat it first if they're already terrified of the carry. You can put it like just on the edge or next to it, but like work them up and get them just to eat in there with the door open. You don't have to close them in, but if they can eat you know, in there, realize, oh, this is a safe place. I like to eat, so I like coming in here because it's where I get my food. That's a good thing. Then from there, uh, you can close do the door, still leave it unlocked when they're in there and just give them treats. So like, oh, when I come in here, I get treats too? Awesome, I'm definitely gonna wanna go in here next time you want me to. And then just increase the amount of time that the door is closed. So the first time you might close the door, pop a few treats in, open it up, and then slowly work up to you know several minutes and so on. Once you get that down, you can take the cat uh, in the carrier in the car, and the door would be locked at this point, so there's no accidents that way, uh, and give, just set the, the cat on the seat in the carrier and give them treats in the car. So now it's, all right, I get to eat in here, I get treats when I come in here. Now when they take me in this weird, smelly car, I get treats in here too. So everything's positive so far, and, and we're slowly working into it. Then go on small trips, um, you know, just back out of the driveway and back in. Sometimes it's helpful to have an assistant so you can focus on driving and, and they can give the treats or vice versa and then increase the, the length of the trip until it's, you know, kind of the, the full uh, trip to the, to the vet's office. That way um, you get to the vet in one piece and the cat isn't already stressed out and angry when I try to get it out of the carrier. So it's a win-win for everybody. Um, and it does work, it just takes some patience and you have to be you know, slow with it, just like training any animal to do any, any trick or conditioning or anything like that. Um, pilling, um, another area of stress for people. Uh, pill pockets uh, made by the Greenies company, I think are one of the greatest inventions of all time. It's basically like a little treat and it's got a little pocket in it here you stick your pill in it and just squeeze it together and a good portion of cats will just eat it. Some of them are too smart and know that there's something in there, but the bulk of them are just excited. They come in like chicken, salmon flavor, and they don't even come in something else. Um, but we use them all the time in the hospital. Um, when it's time to do treatments, we just get out some pill pockets, put their medications in there, and as long as they're eating, you know, if they're not nauseous or anything, most of them just wolf them down, and they see the bag come out at the next treatment session, and they get all excited. So, um, least stress for everybody involved. Uh, very easy to use. It's just like giving a treat. Another option is the pill popper or pill gun, which is this device over here. It's basically uh, like a tube with a plunger in it, and then the green end there is a really soft, rubbery material. And so you still have to open the cat's mouth in one way or the other, as depicted here. And this is how I tend to do it. I use my thumb and kind of middle finger and index finger to grab the sides of the jaw like this, but coming from the top. And then if you just kind of tip the head back, their mouth will just naturally pop open. Um, if it doesn't, you can use uh, your uh, right hand to pull down on the front lip or kind of tug on the skin a little bit. Um, or just use the pill popper to kind of weasel your way in there. Um, but then because it has that soft rubber, you kind of just insert it into the back of the mouth, push the plunger and it shoots the pill out and so it just goes right down their throat. Um, so it's more stressful um, probably for everybody than the pill pocket, um, but it's still better than having to stick your finger in their mouth. Um, so for really aggressive cats, um, we'll use this sometimes as a, as a means to, to get their pills into them. And because it has that rubber bat on there, you don't have to worry about like cutting the back of the mouth or causing any trauma or anything that way. And then the old fashioned way, um, which is scary for everybody. Just look at this picture, kind of cracks me up. Um, so you kind of hold the cat's mouth the same way. And then this poor dude just has his fingers right in there. Makes me nervous. Um, but that would be the other way, is you open their mouth, you have your pill in your finger, and you stick it down the back of the throat. Um, lots of people come in saying they got bit doing things like that, so it has its health risks with it. It's the most stressful for the cat because your finger is a lot bigger than the pill gun even, um, and certainly more stressful than the pill gun. So here's all the resources for the pictures that I used. And are there any other questions? Oh, <laughs> she just makes me crazy um, some days 
almost thanks but she starts whining that annoying whining mm -hmm. and uh and it keeps getting louder and louder so i jump up and i say food water treats we've got everything and it gets on my nerves so i'll chase her uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> it drives me insane. I don't know why they do that, but she's doing it more and more. Yeah. Well, I, she, I think she has you trained a little bit, too. <laughs> and that's kind of her communicating, you know, like, I'm hungry, I want my treats, yada, yada. Uh -huh. um, sometimes they'll do that. You said she's four. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they'll do that, like, if they're sore or something. Probably not the case with her. It sounds like she's just telling you what she wants. We'll also see that um, in older cats uh, with dementia, um, just like people, as, it, as cats get older, um, they get, start getting disoriented and people will describe, uh, you know, like, oh, like it'll be every day at noon, like my cat goes upstairs and he just starts yowling. And as soon as I say, you know, come here, comes right down the stairs and he's good to go. But if I didn't say anything, he would stay up there for hours just lost and yowling. And that's, you know, a common side of dementia. Or uh, like, you know, she just goes and stares at the wall like all day, you know, so things like that. But oftentimes it's a lot of like vocalizing and things like that. So they'll just kind of like walk around in a room, uh, yowling, meowing, and then you're like, oh, come here, kitty, and she's good to go, but that type of thing. But that's, you know, much older cats. Can I ask a question about the clock? Is there an age you should do that? And can, does it matter how old a cat it, is? It's clock? preferable to do it when they're younger. So if somebody wants to do it, I typically recommend it when we're spaying or neutering, just because it's one anesthetic procedure versus two. Um, it's better when they're younger because uh, all of the tissues are kind of more delicate. So the blood vessels are smaller, the tendons aren't quite as thick. Um, you know, the bone is softer, so it's, it's uh, much less stress and there's going to be less information than if we did an adult cat. And can you do an adult cat? We can do, do you, it. Do you ever do I, yeah, from time to time we do. Um, like if it's somebody who adopted an, an older cat and is having some trouble or um, it was an outdoor cat but they brought it in and it's strictly indoor, that type of thing. It's just that everything is kind of bigger and tougher at that point. It's the same thing, you know, with like neutering. Um, if you neuter a little kitten, uh, all the tissues and vessels and everything are really small and, and easy to do. Um, if you wait till they're older, the ligaments are a little tougher, uh, so you have to use more traction, which can cause some more inflammation post-surgery. The blood vessels are a little bigger, so you might have to switch up your technique a little bit, so on. Okay, I think we'll probably end because we're getting time-wise. I guess if they have some questions, they can come up and ask you. Yeah. Thank Absolutely. Thank you very, very much. If you have any particular questions, make sure you ask him. And uh, this, of course, will be on Armstrong if you want to catch everything and see what was happening. Okay, thanks for coming.